We are moving now, uh, in actually the last portion of the book of Genesis, our journey, and we're moving from, from theft, number four, and number five, I mean from civil order, to blasphemy, the number six of, uh, uh, of um, Adam. So let me uh, summarize where we are. So last class, when Jacob woke up from the later dream, he vowed, as you remember, uh, that if he returned home in peace, he and his children would establish a new society in the land of his fathers, a kind of society which mankind had never seen before. A society where the value of the Shekhinah YHVH, like charity, mercy, compassion for the poor and the desolate, would be the official law of the land, not just an expression of a, a, a consciousness, a rare consciousness or good heart, but the real law, law of the land. You can be lashed, get lashes if you don't fulfill it. We, we discussed it last time. He would build as he, he pledges, uh, when he returns home, he will build a temple for God, house for God on that place on the Mount Moriah where he slept. Uh, and uh, the, the, in the dead house of God, the Shekhinah would dwell, and people would come and donate and with donation and, and the prayers. And as long as the temple would stand, uh, uh, this law of Shekhinah, of mercy, will be the official law of the land. There is no such society uh, or ever existed. So the Shekhinah then become a real king of Israel, it means uh, her values are uh, part of the civil law, like uh, living, like living uh, uh, in the field every year, large portion for the poor. Every three years, you leave one tenth for the poor, for the crop. Every seven years, you, you just leave the entire field for the for the poor. Uh, there is no such society ever uh, in the entire world. And you don't do it from your good heart. You do it because the Torah tells you. Because this is a Shekhinah dwelling in the land of Israel and becoming the law of the land. And it uh, reflects itself not only in the field, but in the, in, in the entire, in entire civil law, uh, in the court, in, the, in, uh, in the way people behave in the, in, in the in the street, in the market, in the home, etc. Now, the entire Talmud stand for that. So, uh, uh, let's us. So that's what he pledged. Now, let's not. Let's make a note here that it is so, not natural for the Shekhinah to dwell in any land. It's actually not natural for her to, to dwell, to be present even in our world. As we go back to Genesis chapter one, we recall that, in, that uh, at, at the time of creation, before making Adam, Elohim invited the Shekhinah to come over from her kingdom. We discuss it in our first classes. It, it, it came, uh, invited the Shekhinah to come from her kingdom, the eternal Sabbath, and share with him the newly formed heavenly court, Rashi says, that rule the world together, like Hashem Elohim. Before that, he ruled the world alone, Elohim. Now she comes in from the Sabbath, and they, from here on, they will rule the world, the world together. The Hashem Elohim. And when she entered the world by his invitation, as a dove, as a cherub, uh, we discuss it. 
she observed her, her, uh, her new, new, new word, uh, a word of Elohim, like a bride who observed the, the groom home uh, when she entered it the first time. Could she dwell here or not? And she says to Elohim, so to speak, we discussed it at that time. Uh, she said, how can I rule your world, Elohim, with you, when I have no person here, no, no creature here, that uh, knows me or understand me or can do my work? Uh, there is no place for me to even to put my wing to rest. So Elohim said to her, so to speak, nobody was there to record the, 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 the dialogue, but we can conceive it according to the rabbi. Let's, he says to her, let us make Adam together in our form, in our image. He says in plural. And he, Adam, our child Adam, would be able to recognize you. No, no other creature can recognize you. Do mercy and compassion, but he will be able to do that. He will invite you to, he will be able to invite you into his heart. And he will do your work in my world. And in his heart, you can rest, you can dwell. And, in, and the way he keeps the Sabbath in his, in his heart, in this Sabbath, you can also rest. So Shushina can rest in our home, in our heart, in our Sabbath. The Sabbath day, that the way we keep it, is a place where in time the Shushina rests dwell. That's the Holy Sabbath. So hence, the very presence of Shushina in our world is only on contingency depending on the behavior of Adam. If Adam as a species, as a homo sapiens, accepts her values, admits her into the heart, and emulates her ways, if he does that, as she expects, Adam would become very good, as the Torah says at the end of chapter one, Adam will become very good, in Hashem Elohim eyes, and he would merit entering the next day of the Sabbath day, which is eternal Sabbath, the next day of creation. And this Sabbath day is called the bride. The color. So if Adam become very good, he will see the color, the bride, the Sabbath. That's what we're seeing every Friday night in, in the synagogue. Uh, Walk my, my, my groom towards your bride. The Sabbath is your bride. That's a, the song we sing every night, every Friday night. On the other hand, if Adam fails to recognize and emulate the Shekhinah, as she expects, she would depart from him and from the heavenly court, leaving Adam then in the hand of Elohim alone like before she came. And then, if we are in the hand of Elohim alone, with no mercy, no compassion, you can imagine what will happen to us. He will eliminate us to kala, not, nothingness. So all that is depend on the word kala there. The word kala in Genesis, the right in the right place, the word kala serves for two purposes. Kala is bright, and Kala is nothingness, turned to nothingness, uh, burnt, burnt to nothingness. So either you become, either you see the Kala, the bride, or you see nothingness. Actually, the root, uh, if you think about the, how the Kala, what Kala evolved in, his, in history, a uh, kala is a heart, is a, is a girl, is a, a person or a girl whom your heart is burned to see her, longing so much that uh, you are burned with fire to see her. So that's why the kala can serve as a bride, and in the same way as to burn to nothing. So the two alternatives are mentioned, hinted by the same way. Kala or Kala. 
either you see the Sabbath or you're born to nothingness. So this is a contingency. That's what we are here for, according to the Torah. So in that sense, let me go back to J Jacob. Now Jacob vowed, as he vowed to bring the Shekhinah into our un into society, not only to the heavenly court, she is already in the heavenly court, but if I want to bring her into the society as he pledges in the dream, to draw her from above the ladder into the ladder, number in the, I find the top, into, into our society. So that pledge to, to bring her down is actually a, a movement in the right direction because the Shekhinah wants to dwell in our society and in our heart. So in that case, Jacob pledge is in the right decision, the right direction. So if that happened and, and Jacob managed to build a new society on the land of Israel as you come back, he called Israel, Israel will serve as a model for all the other people, all the other nations, Noahide nations, so that they too would follow the Shekhinah and uh, allow their Shekhinah to enter their heart and their society, and they will build their society emulating the society of Israel. So this is the whole idea. He will be the first to do this. Israel is called the firstborn, uh, firstborn among the nations to show that we are, the, Israel is the first to build a society. What society? Society that bring the value of Hashem, Shekhinah, into this, into, not, in, not from the realm of our pure heart and uh, goodwill, but into the law of society. And from there, it will enter our heart. So that kind of society, uh, hopefully, Jacob hoped that all nations will follow. All the, all the angels of Elohim, if you remember the uh, angel of Elohim who climb up and down on the ladder, are representative of the, nation, of the Noahide nations. So all of them, all the Noahide nations will follow that example and will accept, allow, uh, ashamed to enter their laws. So now as Jacob is returning home in peace and his name has been changed, let's move slowly so we understand what we are dealing with. Now that Jacob is returning home in peace and his name has been changed to Israel, to a new society, is ready to start to fulfill his pledge. He, he will uh, start to build such a society. So that's why Parshat Vayeshev, as soon as he come back to, to Israel, Parshat Vayeshev start in the, in saying that declaring Jacob, Israel, settle in the land of his fatherland. So that declaration means, actually imply, implies that he is ready and expected to fulfill his, his pledge. Now you are back in Israel, you are about, you're supposed to start building such a society. The condition part of his pledge has been fulfilled. He returned back in peace. That was a, a conditional part of the pledge. Now time to pay his due and build a model for all mankind to watch and emulate. But lo and behold, something happened here. As the rabbi noticed, right there, as he returned from, from Israel, the Parsha Vayeshev, since, since that, from that point on, the name of the Shekhinah 
disappear from the text. Can you imagine that? From now on until the end of the book, uh, the, the, the entire many chapters are written by Elohim, name of Midat Adin, Justice alone, as the Ramban, in, Ramban himself uh, said. And you don't need the Ramban, you read it. And the name of YHVH, Shekhinah, is, is, is missing from the entire story. How can it be? And it appears back only in two short segment episode through the entire story of Joseph being sold to, to Egypt. So YHVH, the Shekhinah is disappearing, departing from, from, from uh, Yaakov and returning to the text only in context of two stories, two short stories. The story of Joseph, the story of Judah and Tamar, we will discuss it. And then the story of Joseph with the wife of the Egyptian master. Those two stories only carry the name of Hashem with, with first with Judah and then with Joseph. And beside those two short segments, the rest of the flow of the, of the story back and forth, the name of Hashem is missing. Only maybe the very end there, uh, and when um, Yaak Jacob, uh, before he's dying, he, he give blessing there, he mentioned YHVH once uh, to, to Dan. Talk about that, you, you, you see Samson and Delilah, yeah, fine. But be, beside this, the whole story is bereft of Hashem. Hashem, Shekhinah departed from me. So the opposite, what expected has happened instead, of building a society, starting building society on the land, as expected, to bring the Shekhinah down into the world and to, to show an example for the whole world. Wow, the Shekhinah disappeared from him, just the opposite. So showing that he, he and his children failed to, to, to form that example, to build a society, but instead they did the opposite. They, be, they did something very filthy, very bad, very ugly, that turned the Shekhinah away from them. What was the ugly thing that they played for? You can, you can tell. They sold. They sold the brother. They sold the brother. They spoke bad, first of all, they spoke bad mouth on each other, hating each other, saying all kinds of lies about each other, finally hating each other. And, and finally doing something that un, no other nation can do, no other people can do, no other pe normal people would do. Taking their own brother and selling it as a slave, sex slave to the filthy Egypt. Remember Egypt, as you remember from the letter of Jacob dream, he said that Egypt stood, the angel of Egypt stood at the bottom of the ladder. There are many nations to went up and down somewhere according to the spiritual level, according how many, how many commandments of Noah they kept. Some kept one, some kept two, two, three or four or five. No one kept more than five, at most. But Egypt was at the bottom. It was tall and big, big angel, powerful angel, more powerful than anybody else, but it was at the bottom. He was at the bottom of the, of the ladder. Filthy Egypt, who worshipped uh, death, witchcraft, and sexual perversion. And this family, supposed to be a model of Shekhinah in the world, holiness in the world, 
they corrupt to, to the degree, misbehave to the degree, and, and they sell the brother to that filthy Egypt. So no wonder that since such behavior caused the Shev Shechina to depart from them, leaving their fate now in their hand, if she depart from them, and the whole story is written in the hand of Elohim, Midat Adin, as Rabban says, now we see an opportunity for Elohim to execute the, the, the Gzera, the prophecy, the decree that he told, had, that he told years ago to Abraham, that his children will end up in Egypt. So the moment, El, until now, as El, Shekhinah was in a heavenly court defending us, so the, 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 the prophecy was kind of pushed away. But now that she caused, they caused in her behavior to Shekhinah to disappear from them, and leaving them in the head of the almighty Elohim alone, because the whole story is written Elohim, Elohim back and forth. How many times the Elohim name is appearing is unbelievable. But not, not YHVH. So he, Elohim now, execute the verdict to send them down to Egypt. And I'll tell you what, this is one of the most fascinating stories of the Torah, because you know, here you have an opportunity, we have an opportunity to see how Elohim, the God Almighty, leads the history behind the scene. There is no other scene. We know what, 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 where they are going. As you read the story, you know, oh, everything here would end up with them li living in Egypt. So as, as uh, Hazal says, Ruven, but they are not the people, the, 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 the hero of the story, they are not aware of it. Ruven is, is Ramayin, his own sphere. Judah, his own sphere. Yaakov is in own sphere. Each one is revolving in his own little world. And none of them is aware of what's happening. The hunger and Jacob uh, and the sending to Jacob, uh, Jacob to Egypt and climbing, Joseph is climbing to, to power. All that is, is, is the way that Elohim behind the scene, without them, the Belan participate, participate being aware, how they execute the verdict of Hashem. That's called kingship. When we say God is the king of Israel, it has two meanings. He said, God, Hashem, the God of Israel, is, as we just said, the law. Israel is a society where God, the law of God, mercy, is really the, the law of the land of Israel. That's one aspect. But Elohim, when I say Elohim, is a, 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 another aspect of kingship is he manipulates history. He is not an aloof creator, like Einstein believed, that uh, yeah, yeah, there is a creator there, but does he care if I, if I uh, mess up with my secretary? Probably not. But the Torah says, he, manip he, he, he watch us, manipulate each one of us in his own, in our own sphere, and he has his own plan. He, his plan is to, to bring them down to Egypt. We, the participants are not aware of it. And but we are all, we are all operates under pure, pure choice of will, of pure uh, freedom of choice. Whatever the participants do, they do it from their own choice. Somehow, God in his wisdom manipulate things that they will, the gzera, the decree will be fulfilled. There is no other chapter in the Torah, in the Torah that can compare to that. Because you never know in any other chapter what God wants and what really happened. Even the prophet of Israel, Jeremiah, when they, when they predict or prophesy that the temple will destroy, there's always an option that it will never happen. Repent, it will never happen. They're not so sure. That's why they're crying day and night. You can stop it, you can reverse it. They don't know exactly what happened. 
here we know. Here we know, we are sure, as Rashi says, uh, a, a, a Jacob could be brought to Egypt by many things. He could be brought by chain of, of army, of army putting him in chain, grabbing him, pulling him to Israel. No, he came, to, he came down to, to Egypt in a way that uh, here you describe here in the story where Jacob himself was not aware of it. And nobody was aware that God, Elohim, fulfilling or executing here Xerah decree. So that's another facet of kingship. So what is the situation now? What does it mean as we talk about kingship? That's the time to talk about the meaning of desecrated God name. When I say number six of Adam, uh, I mean, uh, 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 Adam number six is, uh, uh, do not desecrate God's name and do not commit blasphemy. First of all, the most basic meaning of that is don't desecrate the glory, the honor of God as a king. As the father, maybe. The father also have a, a honor as a father and as a king. You can say father king. Yeah, we call God father king, especially in Rosh Hashanah. During the year, we refer to him as our king. So the basic notion, so the very concept of Elohim acting as, as a king, either his law are implemented in his in society of Israel as a king, or as a king who manipulates history. Kingship, by definition, uh, calls for honoring, God honor. Now, when you talk about kingship of Shekhinah, we need to make a point here. The Shekhinah is shy and modest. And she is not here to, to, um, to get the honor like Moses was the most modest of person on earth. He was not here uh, to, to gain any honor, any, any personal issue of glory. The Shekhinah is for loving us, to show love with us, and all we, she expects from us is to love her back. But when we recognize her as a king, uh, which means we enthrone her on us as a king, uh, it calls for our honoring her glory. And she is sensitive to what as modest as she is, she is very sensitive to what's in our heart. And if we disgrace that glory, if we desecrate that glory of the king, if we do something that diminish that glory of the king, that means violating Adam number six, violating God's uh, 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 um, and that's creating God honor and holiness. Holiness is another facet, but let's stick to the to the kings, uh, concept of kingship first. So, how do we then, in principle, how can we violate? God, the number six, Adam number six, by desecrating her name as a king, by doing something that disgraces her name. How can we do that? By three, three basic ways. One way is the most basic way. The most, everybody understand that. If, you, if one is cursing God, bless me, cursing her name, either directly or indirectly, privately or in public. So, so uh, by cursing God, that's a simple explanation of violating number six, simple way to violate God, uh, Adam number six, desecrating God, cursing her. Do not curse God's name. Do not, um, do not do it directly or indirectly, private or in public. A second level 
it's more deeper, more, more, more elaborate is to, to do something disgraceful to God's name. For instance, if I repeat her name repeatedly in class and in vain, it'd be the full name. Suppose I say Aleph Dalet Nun Yun Adonai, I repeat it 10 times with no, with no, with no need. Uh, that kind of uh, make her name cheap. How much more so if I distort her name, if I call her name Jehovah? There's nothing, there's no such thing. Uh, and I said, Jehovah, not only I betray ignorance, but also desecrate her name. That's, uh, that's uh, another way to desecrate her name. So, uh, but the third most important way to desecrate her name, here I quote the Rambam. The most important way to desecrate her name is to cause, to do something that desecrate her name, disgrace her name in the eyes of other people on purpose. Like what you ask? How can I do that? So the Rambam give you an example. If a person is known to be a God-fearing man, he is righteous. He believes in God. He is Torah scholar. He walks with a, a tire and is a, a sure he keep all the mitzvot, all the good. It's perfect. Yet, you catch him, if you caught him doing something very bad to his fellow man, taking advantage of somebody unlawfully something ugly. I don't want to say what, you can imagine. That scene would not only reflect badly on the person himself, but it will reflect badly on the entire tour. Because people, when, when after a court, and the, and the scene is publicized in a newspaper, people will say, oh, this is this show that the Torah failure to mold our character. Look, is this guy sitting in the shiva line all day long, yet didn't stop him from doing it. So that this is a failure of the Torah to change our character. It desecrates God's name, God's glory in the eyes of people, make the glory of God's name cheap. They may believe in God, but they it doesn't matter. Does it, they say it doesn't matter. Uh, if you're not a good person and you're a really good person, the Torah won't help you one way or the other. I heard this many times. Here you say, you see, did you see that person, what he did? So, so the Rambam says, a person who learned Torah, is known to have a Torah, who climb up all the, all the right tablet or Ten Commandment. He knows where the shame, he keep the, he keep the Shabbat, the honor of his father, mother, he keep the Torah. Between him and God, everything is fine. And yet he violate anything on the right tablet between men and men. Once he is known to, to be a righteous person who, who, who have already kept the, the, right, the left tablet, and now, now he violate the, the right tablet, that person violate or the number six of Adam, disgrace God's name, the glory of name of God. So go back to it to, to Jacob. No wonder that if Jacob, the glorious Jacob, who fought with the angel. The angel conceded to him, change his name Israel. You are a new society, you a new nation, a new model for the world. And he's going back to establish a new society of the Shekhinah, in, not only in the heart, but in the, in the temple, and from the temple, it will go into the heart, and so on. 
no, 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 no such society ever existed. So far, it never existed beside Israel. So he pledged to build such a society, and he, but what, what it does, the first thing, he listened to bad mouth. He allows his, his, his children to hate each other so much that they, they disgrace, that they sell their brother, the, the lowest thing that people can ever do. Selling her, her own brother to, to, to the filthy Egypt market, slave market, as the Midrash said. He was 17 boy, years boy, and, and the Egyptian where homosexuality was rampant. There was a free market for, for slave. And he was sold to that market. Selling your own brother to do that? What kind of a low level uh, you, you came down to? No wonder the Shekhinah departed from there with this place. Now, had it, had it not been Judah and Joseph, it, those stories, had there not been an opportunity for the Shekhinah to come back, who knows what would happen to Israel? They would probably disappear in Egypt. Thanks to Judah, and thanks to Joseph, the Torah, the Torah described the downfall of the family, the whole story of Joseph. She set up these two figures, the story of Judah and Tamar, and Judah himself falls, falls out. He leaves his home, he, he goes to a prostitute. He falls, he falls from his grace. And Joseph falls from his grace. So those two people fall down am I, am I, am I, with the other, with the other, with the other uh, siblings. The entire family fall down. And the prophecy depart from Jacob for 17 years, for 30, yeah, for 17 years, until he saw Joseph again, he, he, he never had prophecy again. The Shekhinah completely departed from him. And, but here came these two figures, Judah and Joseph, and in, her, in their behavior, which we learn, God willing, next time, what did they do? And we'll analyze the section and see and who is greater, who was a greater uh, fact, who is a greater uh, person uh, that his action caused the Shekhinah to go, uh, to go to return to, to the family? Was it uh, Judah or Joseph? Both of them caused the Shekhinah to go back, to come back over there, not to, not to abandon the, the, the family, but to stay with them. So, but both of them managed to do that. The question is, well, who was greater because why? Because each one of them, we're talking about kingship here, the kingship of Israel. Yes, there's a king of heaven, but there's also a king on earth. There is a Messiah. So it turned out that each of those characters, Judah and, and Joseph, each one not only led the people of Israel in history, but each one would lead to a Messiah on its own. There will be a Messiah from Joseph, Mashiach ben Yosef, as you know, and there will be a Mashiach ben Judah, David and his and his son and his the son of David. Uh, so, but there were two Messiah. People people at large don't are not aware of it, but each one of those characters, Judah and David, and uh, Joseph would, will produce not only leadership to the Jewish people in history, they lead the, the, not the lead them not only in Egypt, but in history, but also they will finally produce two Messiah. Uh, and, and the question is, what, each, what was the difference between the two Messiah? And what 
is expected from each mess because there are two different characters of Messiah, the two different leadership in Israel competing. And, uh, and which one would prevail? Which one is expected to come back? And uh, we will discuss it in sh shortly in, in our next class, class God willing. I'll probably stop here. Um, I'm expect, I know that you may have many questions. Please go on.